Good evening and welcome to Kelly Baptist Church and our midweek Bible study. Tonight is August the 5th, the year of our Lord, 2020. And we welcome everyone who's going to be hearing this message tonight. And we thank you for supporting our ministry here at Kelly Baptist Church. We remember the sick and afflicted. Uh, we have sent out our prayer list just recently and I'll keep you updated with it. So let's not be far from the prayer altar for all of the needs of our church and our world. Tonight I want to preach a message that the Lord has laid on my heart that is very pertinent and current to what's going on in the United States of America with these movements and, and this cancel culture that has taken over society or those who would allow it to and how we can as a church community, as the bride of Christ, stand up against a cancel culture. C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest Christian authors, once said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. But if true, is of infinite importance. But it cannot be of moderate importance. And when you think about that, it's true. Either one is truly a follower of Jesus Christ, or one is truly a follower of Satan himself, for there is nothing in between. And today I want to ask the question, Kelly Baptist Church, are we a museum for saints? Just a place to come. Or are we a hospital for sinners? Amen. And we're going to look at James chapter 2. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to James chapter 2 and see what God himself has to tell us about this cancel culture subject. Now, I want to tell you a story that is very personal and it's very true that happened to me that I was involved with back in the year 2010. I think you can see on the screen a picture of this homeless man. I was very grieved and burdened that our faculty at Louisiana College when I was president there would, be, would exemplify the behaviors and the worldview of Jesus Christ himself and we would become servant leaders not just ivory tower professors. It's my personal and professional opinion that this, these United States and this world has been negatively affected by what's called the academy. That's American colleges and universities, institutions of higher education. And they have for generations been teaching that which is antithetical to the truth of the Holy Scripture. They teach evolution as truth and create creation or intelligent design as a myth. And they give the world billions of years of age rather than the age that the Bible gives us at, at uh, six, seven, eight thousand years. And so on and so on and so on. And it's the birthplace of abortion. It's where that hedonistic Baal worship was birthed right out of the colleges and universities. And I didn't want our faculty at Louisiana College to be come part of a subterfuge into the cancel culture of the traditional um, institutions known as colleges and universities. So, in order to deal with a biased, prejudiced, snobbish mentality that many universities have, I wanted to test and teach our faculty a lesson in humility and compassion and kindness and love. So what I did right before the Beginning of the year faculty meeting in August of 2010, I hired an actor. And I told no one about this. No one knew. And I asked him to come to the campus dressed as a, looked like a homeless man. And I wanted him to smell like one and look like one and speak like one. I didn't want him to speak articulately. And, and I gave him a little narrative scenario that he was from DeVille, Louisiana, and about his home background. And he just wanted a Christian education at Louisiana College. And I assigned him to go to all the offices and the different departments and tell his story and see how he would be treated. So he did. And through that, it began to be very plain that you can't teach love. You can't teach compassion. You cannot teach selflessness. Something that comes upon us and within us through the power of the Holy Spirit when we're saved. You can't force love. And that's the whole message of God's sovereign will, is that we have a choice to love Him 
He did not force us to accept His love through Jesus Christ on the cross. Well, what happened? Well, immediately some called the campus police and asked him to come and arrest this guy who was humble, exuded humility, but he smelled bad and he looked worse. Some were afraid of him. Some were indifferent and just brushed him off. Some closed the door on him. Some actually told him, you're not welcome here. Some told him, you just need to go home to Deville and just keep your little job and you don't have any place here. But they all gossiped about him. As soon as he hit admissions and financial aid and the registrar's office and the business office and then this professor and this professor and this professor, the gossip stream had started and the word was out around campus that there was a stinking, smelly, ugly, despicable man on campus who dared to get admitted to Louisiana College. But there was one person who saw through that exterior and looked past how he was dressed. Her senses went beyond how he smelled and her hearing heard words from his heart rather than from his tongue. It was Dr. Carolyn Spears, the matriarch of the campus, the 40-year veteran who we all looked up to, to, who had been there longer than anyone else. And she looked at him and she was reminded, well, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. You see, Dr. Spears knew that this man, whoever he was, was imprisoned by society. And he had been imprisoned by the cast aside mentality that the world had treated him probably with all of his life. The same kind of treatment he was getting on this Baptist Christian college campus. Well, she pulled out her pocketbook. She gave him money for new shoes. His whole shoes had holes in them. She said, I'll take you to the store. She did all these missionary things that a Christian does in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, two days later, we had the faculty meeting. He was a, a gossip upon memory two days later. And as I was giving my back-to-school motivational speech, and I was in the very middle of what a great year we're going to have serving Jesus Christ at Louisiana College, down the middle aisle of the auditorium came this homeless man. And I could smell him before I could see him. And he walked down and his boots had holes in them. And he reeked of uh, a foul odor that doesn't come from a day or two without a shower. And he looked disheveled and he walked right down to the middle. And everybody in that auditorium knew he was the homeless man that had visited their office, that had come by their department, upon whose face he'd shut their door or upon whom they had called the campus police to remove him because he was trouble and he didn't fit in. And he didn't deserve counseling, much less money for a new pair of shoes. And as he walked down the middle aisle, I heard the gossiping. I heard the whispering. I saw the laughter come out of certain one's mouths. And he sat, came up to the steps and asked me right in front of everyone, can you help me? I want to go to Louisiana College. Well, I sat on the steps. I talked to him. I asked him where he was from. And he stuttered out a name. And I said, I want you to feel welcome here. And I pulled off those old holy boots. I pulled off the old ragged socks. And someone brought me a pan of water and a towel. And I washed those filthy, dirty feet. And I put his socks back on. I put his boots back on. And I explained to everybody there who he really was. He was an actor. God had put in the pathway of every person on that campus to determine the true heart that is within us. You see, God tells us that when we minister to people, we need to be very careful because we very well may be ministering to those He specifically put in our path, even angels unaware. And the whispering and the gossiping and the laughing turned to weeping and eyes and nose drip, drip, dripping 
with moisture. Kleenexes came out, and there was sobbing, and there was embarrassment, and there should have been. And that's what our message is on today. You see, the church is not a museum for saints, nor is your life, nor your home, nor the world in which you live and you've created around you. It is a hospital for sinners. Until we realize that all have fallen short of the glory of God, we cannot see nor experience the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus came for that homeless guy. Jesus came for you. Equally, on the very ground of the cross, level together, we come equally. No matter what our background is, Jesus came for all. My sister Kay, who's visited in our church, uh, sent me this from a text. I'll read it for you. It's a little bit blurry, but it's a sign that was put up in Odessa, Texas. And it says, 2,000 years ago, Jesus ended the debate of which lives matter. Amen. He died for all. Amen. But you see, we live in a cancel culture that has changed the truth of what Jesus did, what He stood for, and what James said in today's Scripture in James chapter 2. Jesus told us, and Luke wrote in Luke 15, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered this, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Folks, we need to be the kind of person who welcomes sinners and eats with them, who loves them and pulls money out of our wallet to buy them a new pair of shoes because it's the way to minister to those who God has set in our path to test us and try us, not tempt us, with our true Christianity and our true worldview. I hope this message humbles every one of us who hear it today. Turn with me, stand where you are at home. Let's read together as a family, beginning with James chapter 2. He says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Don't be partial to people. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings, in fine apparel, there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes. And you say to the fine clothed person, you sit here in the good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand here. Not sit. You stand in the back corner. And you say to the rich man, you sit here with a footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves? And you've already become judges with evil thoughts by how people look and how people smell. Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen for the poor? of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom in which he promised to those who love him? Listen to that. Has God not promised the poor to be rich? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law According to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. You cannot keep part of the law and not be guilty of abusing all of the law. You see, the first thing that we find out from this scripture is prejudice, partiality. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. We are not to be a respecter 
of persons. We are to treat each person with equality and equalness. And if we translate those words from the original text, don't lay hold of a person's face. Look beyond the face. Now what does that mean? It means don't judge a person by their appearance. Do you think you can help how you look, how, how you were given the genetic condition that God made you? In 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Bible says, For man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. How dare we look on the outward appearance when God himself only looks upon the heart? There is nothing that can hurt the kingdom of God and the work of our Lord more than a snobbishness in a church. Church, I'm preaching to you this morning. Where we look on a certain fake person who because of his economic status or the way he is dressed or the way he looks or the way he smells and judge him to be a certain thing and we treat him accordingly is exactly antithetical what God told us and James told us right here what not to do. Christ is not just talking about inside the four walls of a church on Sunday morning. He's also talking about the church family during the week when we're out in the world. Now, do you know the difference between gossip and flattery? Let me tell you. Flattery is where we say to someone's face what we won't say behind their back. Gossip is where we say behind someone's back what we won't say to their face. You see, when the homeless guy came to Louisiana College, the people who talked to him wouldn't tell him what they really thought. They just treated him in a horrible way. But behind his back, there was gossip. There was ill will. And the Bible tells us, whether you're in the business of flattering or fawning over the rich in the culture, or whether you're in the business of criticizing and gossiping about the poor and the down and out, you are wrong in the sight of God. And what damage it does to the kingdom of God because people believe that you individually represent Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. And as a representative, as a part of the bride of Christ, they're right. We are the church. You are a member of the church. I'm not talking about a member of Kelly Baptist Church, which you are, but I'm talking a member of the church that Jesus Christ has bound to be wed to, the very bride of Christ. A woman asked her husband when they got home from church one day. Nobody in Kelly said this. This was another church, okay? Say, she said this to her husband, did you notice the hat Mrs. Jones had? This morning, he said, no, I didn't notice her hat. She said, well, did you notice Mrs. Smith's new dress? He said, no, I didn't notice that. Well, she said, well, what good does it to you to go to church? You never get anything out of it. <laughs> Folks, that's exactly what happens in churches. We go to see who's there. We also go to see who's not there. And we go to see what somebody's got on and how somebody acts. Church is about Jesus. Amen. It's not about the color of the preacher's tie or if his hair's not combed just right, which mine never is. It's about Jesus. And if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we can't notice all the peripheral things going on around us. He's someone for whom Jesus died. Someone for whom Jesus died, Adrian Rogers said, never judge a jewel because it comes in a plain box. Folks, every soul on this earth has the invitation to believe in Jesus Christ and be saved because he died for every soul in the plain box or in the fancy box. There's a story told, and it's a crushing story, about a person's wounded spirit did you know that Mahatma Gandhi was, before he became leader of the Hindu nation of India, he was searching for a religious philosophy on which he could find himself bound to and stand upon. And early on in his searching, 
he went to a Christian church and he wanted to study Christianity. And he said, I believe Christianity is it. I believe Christianity is what people of India need in order for their hearts to be saved and for them to have something to believe in and believe on. Well, he went to a Christian church to learn more firsthand. An usher met him at the church door. The usher saw the color of his skin, the color of his hair, perhaps the smell of hot magandhi. And when the usher saw him and saw who he was, you know what the usher said? I'm sorry, sir. This church is for Europeans only. Mahatma Gandhi went away with his head down. And he kept studying and he kept searching. And he found the Hindu religion. And he later became the leader of the Hindu nation of India, a man that could have reached multiplied millions of souls for Jesus Christ with the charisma and the stubbornness to tell a story that Mahatma Gandhi had. But someone looked at him and someone laid hold of his face rather than looking at his heart. What a crime and a shame. The ground around the cross is level. All people are precious in the sight of God. And if you haven't learned that, you've not learned anything in the church. And even the rudiments of Christianity teach the level ground at the cross of Jesus Christ. Notice how the Bible does not say there's not to be an issue with seniority. It says there's not to be an issue with superiority. Yes, there's seniority in a, per, in a church. Yes, there's seniority in people. The Bible speaks of those who have labored long and worked hard in the doctrine, who have earned seniority and even earned authority, mostly through their humility and their selfless ways of serving others. Romans 13, 7, honor to whom honor is due. There is seniority and there is authority in the church, but there should never be superiority. Peter talked about the, the position of the poor. I mean, James talked about the position of the poor. He said, hearken, my brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world. Don't you know that the poor people of this world were ordained and chosen by God? Most people who are poor don't choose and ask to be poor. You see, God loves the poor. He loves the common man. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. You see, the wise professors at Louisiana College were confounded by the foolishness that God brought to their door because it didn't fit the narrative of their lives. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen and the things which are not to bring to naught things that no flesh should glory in His presence. What He's saying is, He chooses the little, the weak, the poor, the unknown. He chose Gideon, who was a joke, so that He could esteem His glory in heaven, not Gideon's, and all the glory would go to God, but He would use little old weak, timid Gideon to do it. Moses, who was a stutterer, said, God, I can't even speak. And God said, I'll have a, your, your brother, Aaron, high priest, to speak for you. You see, God has a, a special kind of hierarchy. And it's not a hierarchy that is up and down. Poverty and wealth are relative. I don't care how poor you are today, I can find someone who is poorer than you are. I promise you. I don't care how wealthy you are today. I can find someone wealthier than you. James said the poor have a special place. There was a missionary named Adoniram Judson. He was a missionary to Burma. And he labored long and he prayed hard and he fasted and he witnessed. And he was really called to bring souls to Jesus Christ. 
And while he was in Burma witnessing and sharing the gospel, he was arrested. They tortured him. He was strung up by his thumbs. He was ridiculed and beaten. Finally, he was cut down and he was cast into a vile, dirty, vermin rat infested prison which was more than a small not much more than a small hole in the ground his tormentors came to Judson and said what about your plans to win the heathen to Christ now what do you have to say about your future here in Burma you know what he said he said my future is as bright as the promises of God and I want to tell everyone here today who feels down and out and you may be down and out your future is as bright as the promises of God. And if you're poor and you're doing without and you're in a bad way, God has special promises for you. Because the Bible tells us He chose you. And He chose you to confound the very wisdom of the fools of this earth who think they've all got it made because they have more coins in their pocket than you do. You see, we tend to want to put men on levels and put them in categories. We've created an upper class, a middle class, a lower class. You can't listen to the news any day of the week without hearing it. But I want to tell you something, that's all relatively out the window. Because that's all relative to where you live. Because if you go to deep dark Africa in Tanzania, you'll find a lower class here as an upper class there. And besides that, the kingdom of God is not measured by how much money you have in the bank on earth. It's how much you've stored up your treasures in heaven. God makes the, His divisions vertically this way. The sheep and the goats. The saved and the lost. The saints and the ain'ts. As Dr. Rogers always calls them. And that's the way God divides. When it comes to being saved, we're all on level ground before the cross. And you're not more sinful than the next guy. Jesus' blood died for the sins of all men and all the sins of all men. When Jesus Christ showed His bright light before Paul on the road to Damascus, He said to Paul, Saul at that time, why are you persecuting me? Can't you just hear Saul with his answers? Well, I, 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 whoever you are, I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting those Christians. Oh, but don't you see? When Paul was persecuting the Christians, he was persecuting Jesus Christ. Folks, I want to tell you, when you shun that poor man on the street or that poor woman that walks into the back of the church who doesn't know if she's welcome or not, you're shunning Jesus Christ. When you speak against the poor servant of Jesus... You're really speaking against Jesus Himself and it's blasphemy. He said in Matthew 25, Inasmuch as you've done it to the least of one of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. Why persecutest thou me? The sign I showed you before. 2,000 years ago, Jesus ended the debate of which lives matter. He died for all lives. I am sick of hearing which lives matter the most. That is blasphemy against Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ died on the cross with this across his chest. All lives matter. And anyone who says different is blaspheming Jesus, not Joe Aguilar, not white supremacists, not privileged white people or red-headed people or black people or blue people in blue suits. We are all children of the Almighty God and we have all sinned and we have all come short of the glory of God. And Jesus said, all lives matter. Be not a respecter of persons. Be not partial to the wealthy or the white or the black or those in blue suits. In my kingdom, the ground is level before the cross and I show no partiality. I forgive all the sins of all men. Don't you dare blaspheme Jesus Christ and select a certain group who matter more than another group. Here's a picture I've used so often. 
You see that woman in the picture? And those of you who've been in church here before, you know what I'm about to say. Do you see a beautiful young lady or do you see an old hag? Well, I see over here a beautiful young lady. If you look at her chin sticking out, and then I see over here an old hag. But you see, people, it's the same picture. It's the same woman. And that's what Jesus Christ is trying to tell us. The same person you see as an undeserving, degenerate person, I see as a soul that I, Jesus Christ, can wash clean and make as white as snow, make young again, give a glorified body to and live forever in eternity with this soul. Who are we to be respecters of persons in order that we decide which group of people by the pigmentation of their skin rather than the character of their heart? Jesus said, For it is man who looks on the exterior, but God looks on the heart. I pray that our church would be a changing momentum in this world of cancel culture that tells you who is privileged and who isn't because none of us are. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. Kelly Baptist Church, are you a museum, museum for the saints or are you a hospital for sinners? Black and yellow, red and white, they are all precious in His sight. Jesus loves us all. There was a little fellow who left his home and walked for miles to a certain church and he walked past many churches and someone asked him, why do you go so far to go to church? Someone asked. Why do you go to that church? And the little boy said, because they love a fellow over there. Folks, you can't fake love. You can't pretend kindness or selflessness. It comes from the Creator from His Son who died for you on the cross. It is through Him that we are have His mercy and His grace and His righteousness imputed into us. And through that imputation from Him to me, I can love you. And I can love you from the inside out, not from the outside in. Kelly Baptist Church is not a perfect church. No church is. But one of the things I'm going to say that I love most about Kelly Baptist Church is I truly believe we're a hospital for sinners and not a museum for saints. Now don't, don't take that to let it get off your guard and quit loving or back up on loving and caring for people who need help. But I want to tell you, if you're looking for a loving church that's not going to look down their nose at you and send you away because this church is for Europeans. If you're looking for that kind of church, come to Kelly Baptist Church. I've had so many people who have invited to church with a loaf of bread. And the first question or first rhetorical statement was, I don't have anything good to wear. And I said, you, then you're going to be right at home because neither do we. God looks on the heart, not on the exterior. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you being admonished by James. Lord, that we are not to look upon people according to how they smell or how they dress or how they sound. And I'm not talking about the poor. I'm talking about the rich, the middle class, the poor, whoever it is. Because all of that is relative in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of the kingdom of God. The only thing that matters is the imputation of of your saving grace in our lives that we draw others with true love to you and not look down our nose at their life situation. Just like Lazarus at the gates of the rich ruler when he was in heaven, he laid on the bosom of Abraham himself and was clothed in the glorious righteousness of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we all be clothed in your righteousness. May we all not take part in the cancel culture, but may we spread lovingly that Jesus died for all the sins of all men. I pray it in the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior, Lord God and King. Amen.